for this meeting. I want to speak to you uh, on the subject of the Jonah syndrome. The Jonah syndrome. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Jonah. That's page 1227. That's not going to do you much good unless you have a Bible identical to mine. But uh, Jonah, if you want to know where Jonah is, he's right after Obadiah. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. And so it's uh, right in that area. They call these guys the minor prophets. I have no idea why they call them that because the truth is everything they said was major. But uh, I want to speak to you on the subject of the Jonah syndrome. Now, the word syndrome is an interesting word. It means a characteristic combination of opinions, emotions, and behavior that denotes a certain condition. Say it again. It's a characteristic combination of opinions, emotions, or behavior that denotes a certain condition. Another definition that I love is a group of signs and symptoms that occur together and characterize a particular abnormality or condition. What we're going to do today is find out if maybe there are those of us that at one point or another, at one level or another, have the Jonah syndrome. And the way we're going to do that is to simply discover this book together over the next few minutes. It's a very short book, but the lessons are powerful here because this book reveals the character of our God and also his point of view concerning certain things. What you need to understand about the study of the Old Testament is that in the study of the Old Testament, the emotions and the point of view of the living God are laid bare. They are in stark contrast to the views of man and to the culture. And as you begin to walk through the Old Testament, you begin to discover who God is and how he thinks. What you also need to understand is that from the beginning of the book to the end of the book is the revelation of the holy God. And just because we happen to be in the age of grace does not mean that the character the personality or point of view of God has changed at all. It has not. You're still serving the same God. And here in Jonah, we're going to make some discoveries about God and the way that he thinks and the way that he looks at us in the various stages and decisions of life. So let's get started. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Um, this is the first observation. The word of the Lord is not optional. When God gives a command, a word of direction or a directive, it is not a decision that we can afford to defer. We don't put off a word from God. We don't dilute a word from God. And we certainly don't ignore a word from God. In the Old and the New Testaments, the kingdom of God operates on the power source of God's spoken word. Men did not move until they got a word from God. They did not act until they got a word from God from God. His word was the complete, initial, and final directive of humankind. 
Ladies and gentlemen, even though we are famously distracted today, what you need to understand is you are a part of that same kingdom, and we need to get back to a woke understanding that our God's word is the final word on everything. Now, I can tell you that there have been times in my life when if I had not acted on a word that I received, my life would have been greatly altered. I told the story a couple of three weeks ago about my time in the NFL and how that I was with the Washington Redskins. There was only one job available. It was the third quarterback. There was no one in the camp to compete with me for that position. I was going to make this team. I was going to get an NFL salary. I was going to have an opportunity to be a part of that squad. It was going to be the easiest gig I had had so far. And God spoke to me. As a 23-year-old man, God spoke to me in sentences in my mind and spirit and said this very thing, this is your last day. And I walked over to Coach George Allen, and I resigned. Now, if I had not heard that word, if I had not obeyed that word from God, I would have missed the answer. Every one of us need to understand the seriousness of obeying a word from God. You cannot ignore it. You cannot evaluate it. It's not a matter of a big opportunity or a small opportunity. Teddy Grover and I met in 1984. We have been together all except six years where he went to get an education that he absolutely didn't need. <laughs> he knows I'm still bitter about the six years that he left me. I'm just kidding. I love that guy. We started in 1984 together as an evangelistic team. That is, we would literally go into cities across North America and different parts of the world. We actually went to China, Hong Kong, and... Uh, the thing I remember about that, honestly, is that Teddy would need a thing. In fact, let me just tell you this story. It's nothing to do with the message, but I just got to tell you this story. We were, we were in a large school, and they were going to feed us lunch. But Teddy hated the food over there, all of it. And the truth is, he never even gave it a chance. He would not eat that. He told me he wouldn't eat that with my mouth. I mean, that's what he said. And so I love the food. So I'm eating the food, and we're all sitting there eating. And Teddy's right beside me, and I'm looking over. And when the person who was serving the food and those that had cooked the food weren't looking, he would grab food, scrape it into his napkin, and put it in his lap so that it looked like he had been eating. So I quickly called him over and said, Look, he loves it. Bring him some more. True story. Everywhere we went, we were having revival. Everywhere we went, the services would begin with the sanctuary half full. And it would end with standing room only. People in the altars, people being delivered, people being baptized on the Holy Ghost, people being called to ministry, young people on fire. It was glorious. Every place we went, it was like that. And in the middle of it, I hear the voice of God. I want you to go home and serve your father. I want you to go home and make sure that he finishes well. I didn't question it. I just obeyed it. But may I tell you that if I had not obeyed it, 
I would have missed the richest, most amazing season of my life. Do you understand that there's not a day that passes by that I don't drive through this city and love it with all of my heart? Do you know that there's not a day that passes by that I don't drive onto that little campus over there on Broad Acres and tears often fill my eyes and immediate automatic praises are lifted to the Lord. Thank you, God. I wouldn't be anywhere else in the world. I was in Louisville, Kentucky last weekend preaching at a large church and just enjoy Pastor Bob Rogers so much who has pastored that church for many, many years. And I enjoyed going to their Christian school and sharing with their coaches that following Monday morning. But do you know that every moment I was there, my heart ached for home? Do you know that I have found such fulfillment, such grace? I have found such acceptance. I've found such joy in this place. And I think, oh God, what if I'd argued with you? What if I'd tried my best just to do something else other than to just do what you ask me to do? You see, what you need to understand is the word of the Lord is not optional. But thank God it'll set you free. Thank God it'll fulfill your heart. Thank God it'll allow you to be more self-actualized than any experience you could ever choose for yourself. Thank God it becomes the way, the truth, and the life for you when you obey. Now here's the second observation. Verse 2. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Aren't you glad that even when a city like Shreveport has so many things wrong with it and it is such gross disobedience to God that God always sees the potential of it being great? You know what I declare over Shreveport? I declare that Shreveport is a great city in Jesus' name. That's not my point. Here's my point. God's answer for wickedness is always to send someone with his word. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. What is the answer for what's happening in the Oval Office? We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. What is the answer for what's happening on Capitol Hill? We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. What is happening Right now in City Hall, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. What is the answer for every government on the face of the earth? We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The answer is not to get your guy in the White House or your, your elected official who has morality in the right place. The answer is not for you to get the right mayor that you approve of. The answer is not for you to somehow form an organization that is able to implement plans and structures that you feel would be the answer. The answer for the principalities and powers that we are facing is for God to send men and women with the word of God in their hearts and on their lips because there is only one thing that the devil fears and that is the preached, spoken, powerful, authoritative, eternal word of the living God. God. It's the word that is the answer for the evil that is in the world. Hallelujah. You don't even have to be able to quote it verbatim. You could just get a piece of it and have authority over the devil. There was a woman many years ago, I heard the story of a woman who claimed a, a verse because she was coming home late every night and she was in a part of town where uh, there had been crimes committed and so she had a verse that she had memorized that under his feathers you shall abide. And, and he, she had, had memorized this, this scripture of, of, and had it verbatim. I don't, but she had it verbatim. And uh, sure enough, the night came, the terrible night came when there was a man wielding a knife that, that, um, that just accosted her. 
and grabbed her and had the knife, and she was so terrified, she forgot her scripture. Totally forgot it. So she just screamed at the top of her voice, feathers, feathers, feathers. The man dropped the knife and ran because just a fragment of this book can send every devil running. I want to tell you the answer for wickedness is always to send someone with his word. Here's the third observation. Verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Number three, when you run from God, he notices. When you run from God, he notices. Some of you feel that God's kind of like the IRS. As long as you don't get a letter from him, you're okay. <laughs> the fact is, when you run from God, he notices. If you are in disobedience and running away from God, he notices. God knows where you are. And he knows whether or not you are doing what he told you to do. You know, some of you, God spoke to you years ago about your prayer life, but you've still disobeyed him. You're not doing what he asked you to do. Some of you, God spoke to you about your tithe years ago. You've heard teachings on it, but here's what you've told him. I can't afford to do that. You've disobeyed him. When you run from God, he notices. Some of you are supposed to be more active in this church. I'm not putting a guilt trip on you because I wasn't the one that spoke that to you. You heard that in a service. And then you heard it in five services. I want you to be involved here. And what you said to God was, I just got to get my schedule right before I can do it. Let me say this. God always expects to be first in your life. And when he speaks to you, and you run from it, he notices. He always knows exactly where you are in relationship to what he spoke to you to do. Now, folks, again, I'm not speaking these things to you. I'm talking about in reference to your own individual obedience. I am referring to something that God has already said. You know, if you're running from God, you know it, don't you? You know if you're saying no to Him. Here's the fourth observation. Verse 3 again. Let's continue reading in verse 3. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port, Tarshish. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. The ship to Tarshish is the way you choose over what God has said. You see, what we do is that we negotiate with God. God says... I want you to do this. We say to God, oh, oh that's good, that's good. I, I know, I can see myself doing that. But, you know, I, I feel like I could be a better blessing over here, honestly. With my gifting and what, you know, my personality type. You know, I, I mean, I see that, Lord. I see that, Lord. But I think over here I can use what you've given me. And after all, isn't that what's necessary? Is that I just be used in a way that I feel most comfortable. You know, the only problem I have with our taking personality tests and placing that person, because I started this thing here, by the way. I started this whole thing of testing spiritual gifts, and, you know, my friends have done it. But what I can tell you, I only have one caution. We'll continue to do this, but I've only got one caution. And that is, if God says something 
for you to do that's completely contrary to your comfort zone or your personality uh, gifting, then I want you to promise me that you will hear him and you will do it. You see, the final word has got to be God's word. Our, our job as those who preach the gospel, as those who live the gospel, as those who define the gospel in our generation is not to make a generation comfortably, culturally in the kingdom of God. Our job is to show them a way that is so radically different than anything that they've ever seen that they will be shocked with the understanding that there is a God who wants to be intimately involved in every detail of their life. And when they are inadequate, He is the one who becomes their capability. See, the ship to Tarshish is the way you choose over what God has said. It's the compromise. It's the negotiation. I'm still a believer. I can be effective over there. You know, I mean, I'm living for God, and, you know, that's better than I was doing. I'm better at this over here. No, 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 no. You need to do exactly what God told you to do. Yeah, but you know what? It didn't work out. What do you mean it didn't work out? Well, I didn't have an open door there. I didn't really, wasn't really able to. So, folks, let me just tell you this. In the words of that old saint, Bum Phillips, when the Houston Oilers were failing to get to the Super Bowl, he said, next year, he said, we're going to kick the door down. I'm going to tell you, if you hear God speak to you, and you know without a shadow of a doubt that it's the will and it's the purpose of God, you do what God told you to do, no matter if it's convenient or there's an opportunity or not. You find a way to be a part. Amen? I said you find a way to be a part. You know, I can remember as I look back over my shoulders, so many believers that gave their lives to the Lord, you know, people that came to the Lord and they wanted to be involved. And they didn't have the slightest idea. They're brand new to the faith. But I would watch them show up. Man, I love the people that just show up. And I would watch them show up. And they would just stand there. You know, we'd, we'd be maybe having choir practice. And they weren't singers, but they felt like they were to be a part of something. So they'd just be standing there at the choir practice. They'd just show up. And then maybe there was a Sunday school class. Well, they didn't have the wherewithal to teach a Sunday school class. Not yet. But, you know, when the people would meet in the leadership councils, they, they're, just, they're just there. They're just standing there. They're standing there, and everywhere you look, you'd see these people just standing there. They're just there. They're just showing up. Why? Because they determined that when they heard the voice of God, that they were going to step forward in obedience. You see, what I've discovered is this. If you will take one step, then God will provide the path to the glory of obedience. Here's the fifth observation. Verse 3 again. Verse 3 again. Willful disobedience is never okay with God. Willful disobedience is never okay with God. You see, there's, there's a difference between disobeying and willfully, habitually disobeying. What are you going to do with your faith and your relationship with God when you know you are willfully, habitually disobeying Him. You, sooner or later, you have to come to grips with that. I am willfully, habitually disobeying God. You know, I do a lot of counseling with men and women uh, about their marriages. Uh, mostly in the past. I don't do as much anymore, but I recently had a wonderful experience with a couple here in the church is just wonderful seeing what God did in their lives but one of the things I always say to a man that's speaking disrespectfully to his wife or a wife that is in a rage speaking disrespectfully to her husband is is I said you can change that well I don't know I just get I just fly off the handle I said okay how many times have you done that with your boss Well, never. Well, I'd say you're probably in control then, wouldn't you? You don't just 
walk into your boss and say, I hate everything about you. I'm serious. Or, right. why are you gaining so much weight? You're fat, fat, fat. You know people talk to their mates like that? I mean, I mean, come on, come on, folks. Really? You say, well, of course I didn't say that. that that's, my, that's my boss. No, no, because you are totally in control of what you say, friend. Believe it. I'm just saying. And when we talk about the will and the purpose of God, you see, first of all, you have to lead yourself before you lead anybody else. And so God commands you, I want you to do the difficult thing. I want you to go to the Nineveh of self-control. I want you then to go to the Nineveh of Christian giving. I want you to give your time, your talent, and your treasure. And then I want you to go to the Nineveh of leadership. Yeah, it's tough. It's hard. It takes more time than you ever dreamed. But these are my plans, my spoken plans for you. I want you to get this done. But instead what we do is we willfully disobey God. And believe me, habitual disobey, disobedience is always willful. Here's the sixth observation. Willful disobedience will always bring storms from God. Willful disobedience will always bring storms from God. When God has called you and you disobey him, he is going to send storms. Now, there are four sources of storms that you can encounter. One is from the world. The world will bring storms just because you're in the world. How many of you understand there were a lot of good people that lost stuff? In Katrina, a lot of Holy Ghost people lost their stuff in Katrina. Why? Because they live in a world and storms come to the world. Storms also automatically come to your emotional world. They come to your spiritual world. They come to your familial world. Every one of you experience storms that just come from the world. Secondly, you could have a storm that came from the flesh. That is missteps you've made that cause storms in your life. It's the 65-year-old uh, dad or granddad that jumps on the skateboard of his 14-year-old teenage grandson and says, oh, I used to kill this thing. And then 20 minutes later, they're in the uh, ambulance headed to the hospital with a broken pelvis. You know, the fact is, nobody, nobody calls that, it wasn't God, it wasn't, it wasn't the devil, it, wasn't, it, it was that dude. He was 60, he didn't say, I'm 65 years old, for Pete's sake, I can't get off the couch. I, why am I trying to ride, a, a, I, what am I doing? He absolutely had a storm because of a fleshly choice. And then there's the devil, let me tell you, there is... There is an evil prince in this world who has a design on your life and he will come against you. You will feel his invasion of your home at times and there will be a swirling of, of evil and of stress. You know what I tell people all the time? I say when you begin to feel the atmosphere of your home taken over by the enemy, and there began to be things happen that you know are inspired by the evil one. You have to remind him that you are a covenant child of God and that your house is owned by a covenant child of God. And you need to go over and open your door and say in the name of Jesus, I command every evil spirit to leave my house, get off of my property, and don't you ever come again. You see, we do have storms that come from the evil one. But let me tell you the storm that you never want. You never want the storm from God. Because you can't rebuke that one. You can't solve that one by being more agile. When the storm comes from God, it comes with an intent. He is trying to turn you from the Tarshish of your disobedience. And here, of course, 
we know what happened is that a storm came. And then here's the next observation. Jonah's bring storms with them. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear this. Please hear me. Please hear me. You've got to hear this. This may be the most important part of what I'm going to say. Sometimes you discern a storm from God when there is a storm attached to everything you do and everyone in your household. That is probably a storm from God. God is probably trying to get through to you. Jonah's bring storms with them. You know that some of you right now are in a terrible situation in your business because you did not recognize the Jonah in your midst. Do you understand that a Jonah can bring your business down? Because wherever Jonah goes, he brings a storm with him. Wherever Jonah works, he brings a storm with him. Jonah's marriage is always in trouble. Jonah's children experience a rebellion that is telltale. You see, the fact is, when everything in your life begins to have a storm attached to it, you probably are dealing with a Jonah syndrome. And what you need to do is to do exactly what Jonah did next. Because in verse 17, the Word of God says this. It says, and let me read this whole thing for you very quickly, 4 through 17. Uh, 4 through, uh, yes, 4 through, what did I say? 4 through 17, 13. Okay, here we go. Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Verse 6, captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we won't perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and a lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble for us. What do you do? I mean, these guys were really intense. <laughs> Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the land. Now, if he already knew that, why did he get on that boat? This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? He said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. He replied, and it'll become calm. I know that's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you please. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now here's what you have to understand about modern-day Jonas. Modern-day Jonas rarely come to the conclusion that they are bringing the storm with them. Modern day Jonah's always blame the boat captain. They don't understand that the reason it never works out for them that this environment is as bad as the last environment and the next environment is as tough as this environment is because they are Always blaming the boat captain. It's always just the sea's fault. It's always just the navigator's fault. But Jonah knew, and he confessed readily. He said, I, you know, I did this. And the Word of God says in verse 17, But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. God prepares a fish for every Jonah. Now, let me just say this to you. You may think you can run from God. You may think that you can disobey him, 
that you can continue to live like you're living. But let me just give you the good news today. There is a big fish headed your way. And it is a fish that God has prepared for you. You say, oh, that's scary. Well, no, and he's not going to eat you. Because that's not what the fish is here. The fish is not a predator. This fish swallows Jonah and closes him out, off from the outside world so that he has an opportunity to get his life right. Let me say this to you. The fish God is sending to you is going to give you an opportunity to repent. But this is what will happen. Your life will be walled off. You will not be able to do the business that you plan to do. You will not be able to reach the goals that you have set. You will not be able to have the health that you need. Something is going to happen in the near future where God in His mercy and His great grace is going to send a fish where you are closed off from the world and where you can hear only one voice. You people that want to go deep in God, this is the definition. Get swallowed by a fish, it'll take you deep. You'll hear only God. You will be able to respond only to Him. And for three days and three nights, let me tell you, that's what happened here. Jonah is talking only to God. God has His complete attention. Do you know that God has a way of getting your complete attention? I received a call from a man, and I'll, I won't give you names and I won't give you context. But I received a call from a man. He said, Denny, he said, you and I both know that I have not been right by you. That I've said things I shouldn't say. And I, I've been an enemy to you in many ways. He said, but I have a son that has been put into a mental institution. And he said, it's crazy. He said, overnight he lost his mind. He was perfect one day, and, and now he's in a mental institution. And I went to pray, and the Lord spoke to me and said, you make things right with Denny Duran, or he will never be healed. Now, that wasn't important to me. I can tell you that I didn't have anything against that man. But yet, that's what he heard in prayer. I said, look, I'm all right with you. He said, I know. He said, but you got to tell me that you are receiving me now, that you're receiving my apology, and you have got to go lay hands on him. Because if you don't go lay hands on him, then he's not going to get well. I said, I said, I'm there, man. I'm there. I said, you know I love you. I know you love me, but this is the truth, and you know it's the truth. I went to the place where this young man was being held. I walked in. I laid my hands on him. God completely set him free. He's completely well today you say would God do that yes and that's what you've got to understand you are serving a God who does not play and he is going to let you go and go and go and go and go he's going to let you sail to the sunset sail to the horizon he's going to let you do what you do in running from him until the day when he doesn't and on that day, I promise you, he will have your complete attention. He will break your heart if he has to. But he will touch the thing that means most to you because he loves you so much that he will not allow you to run anymore from his grace. You say, oh, I've been doing a good job for 20 years. Yes, my friend, but you have to understand that you're serving a God. One day, this is a thousand years with him. He is going to deal with you. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And for some of you, it's coming very soon, or I would not have been prompted to preach this message. My friend, all you have to do is turn wholeheartedly to him. Do what he has asked you to do, and it will be over. Here's the next observation. 
and then we're going to close. The fish is always equipped with a prayer room. God doesn't send the fish to destroy you. He sends the fish to get back in touch with you. He sends the fish so that you can seek him again. You have to understand in 50 years of ministry, I've dealt with a lot of Jonas. And I love when the story of Jonah ends well, which it did here. He did what God asked him to do. He still had a little attitude problem toward the end of the book. But he did exactly what God asked him to do. And I want to say this to you. It doesn't matter how long you've been running, how long you've been sailing on that ship to Tarshish. God is a God who says, I will still culminate this in great, great success and blessing. I'm going to bless you in spite of yourself. I am going to call you to a place of complete surrender. Stand with me, please, all of this, please. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Denny began a um, series last week on the resurrection. This didn't sound like it fell in line with that. Matthew 12 and 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. To think that God, the Son, would choose the story of Jonah to further illustrate the glory of the resurrection is amazing, isn't it? But that's exactly what he did. You see, this is what God's got for you. He's got resurrection. He never said it would be easy. I said he never said it would be easy. Never said it wouldn't be hard. He never said that your road back would be pleasant. But this is what he has made sure of, that you understand. When you turn your face away from disobedience and back to say, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. Listen to me. At that point, he is always there. He is always there.